Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode 328 for April 15th of 2016. Toyota's fuel cell is right here. Watch Auto Line After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Gary, you want to do a show? Why don't we do that with advanced technology? <laughs> okay, why don't, why don't we get Mark Phelan from the Detroit Free Press here? Oh, t- I'm Mark. sorry, I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> Great having you back on the show here, Thank Mark. You. Always good to have you here. And uh, we got to let everybody know we got Jackie Birdsall, the chief engineer. Oh, shit. is that right? No, what, what's your title, Jackie? <laughs> I'm a senior engineer. Senior engineer yes. with Toyota. With Toyota. Working on the fuel cell car, the Toyota Mirai. Correct. And we've got it here in the studio. As we keep telling everybody, we, we love having engineers and, and their product in here in the studio. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So what's your involvement in the car? Because most of this was done in Japan, right? That's now, right, yeah. And, but you're here in Michigan? Uh, our team is actually located in Los Angeles. Uh-huh. Um, the team that I work with, we do North American suitability of the vehicle. So um, it is developed mainly in Japan, uh, the components. It's built at the Motomachi plant in Japan. But then we get the prototype vehicles, and we take them to Death Valley. We take them to Yellowstone. We make sure that they work, you know, really So you're involved in all the testing of this stuff? All of the testing of it, down to even the high-pressure storage system, which is actually my specialty. High-pressure storage of... Hydrogen. Hydrogen. That's correct, yes. How high a pressure are you, are you talking about? Uh, we store it at 10,000 PSI in this vehicle. Wow. So the tank has literally, the fuel tank mm-hmm. has literally got to be bulletproof, right? It does, yes. <laughs> y- you can shoot, what, 30-odd six into this thing and the bullets will bounce off. It, they sure will, yeah. It's and there's pretty, two tanks, pretty difficult right? To get. That's correct, yeah. Two, two tanks, tanks, not just one. Two oh, really? Tanks. Yes. Why two? Um, because since they are cylinders, they're non-conformable, so you have to figure out a way to design around them. And obviously designing around one large tank is a bit more difficult to keep your passenger space versus designing around two smaller tanks. Mm-hmm. And we still want the amount of hydrogen that we have on board to get the range, which is about 312 miles for this vehicle on a, on a five-minute fill. And, so what, and, and what do you make the, what's the material you actually make the tanks out of? Because for uh, some, in some of the early days of fuel cell, that was one of the questions. How will they be able to get something that you can shoot a bullet into? How, how can you, because people were afraid of the Hindenburg effect, even <laughs> though we all know the Hindenburg wasn't caused by hydrogen, but people still get a little nervous. So how do you, how, what's the material you use? I can't tell you how happy that makes me to hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> you just saved me a, an answer. Um, the tanks are made of three layers. So there's a, a plastic layer that is what essentially holds the hydrogen in. It keeps it from being able to permeate through the other layers. So that's kind of the layer that contains the hydrogen. And then there's a carbon fiber layer on top of that that gives it the strength so it's a really thick carbon fiber. That's where the bulletproof comes from. And on top of that, we have a, a glass fiber layer that protects the carbon fiber layer if you were to drop the tank, any kind of surface damage on the carbon fiber. And we're talking about just a couple of cylinders that look like scuba tanks or welding you know, you know, tanks that are just crosswise uh, in, in the car. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And 10,000 PSI because the higher the pressure, the more you can pack in there, right? And the greater the range. Exactly. Yep. The, we get more range out of the higher pressure. Mm-hmm. So what causes the car to go? What (laughs) powers the vehicle? So when you have the hydrogen, but then it's used to do what? So uh, this vehicle is a hybrid in that we have the hybrid synergy drive on board. And so if you're familiar, I know you guys are familiar. I don't have to say if you're familiar. You are familiar with uh, our hybrid synergy drive. So sometimes it goes from the battery, sometimes directly from the motor, but it's always kind of working together. In this case, instead of, Having a gasoline engine, we have the fuel cell that creates the electricity on demand that powers the electric motor. And then instead of having the gasoline tanks, we have the hydrogen tanks that feed the fuel cell that creates the electricity. So it's an all-electric vehicle, but we still have the the battery to capture the regenerative braking because although the fuel cell can create electricity, it can't store it. So we still have those components that we borrow from 
our hybrid signature drive vehicles and then just uh, made it up with a fuel cell. And, and the fuel cell is one of those things that looks like magic to a person who's not an engineer. It, it, it's a chemical reaction and hydrogen you know, goes in and electricity and water come out, right? <laughs> it is actually You magic. forgot the magic one. It wand. is magic. Yes, is magic. sorry. <laughs> Unicorn tears, but explain you know, the whole, exactly. the whole day. <laughs> Jackie, explain it in very simple terms. How does a fuel cell work? So it is, oh, it's called an electrochemical reaction. And we introduce hydrogen on one side, that comes from the tanks, and then oxygen on the other side, that just comes from the air, from the intake system. And the two see each other, and they want to bond. So hydrogen's always bonded to something. It's never just floating in the atmosphere by itself. It, it has a very strong affinity to want to have a partner. So we introduce the oxygen on the other side of a membrane, uh, we have a catalyst there, a small platinum layer that catalyzes the oxygen and, and the hydrogen. The protons and electrons break through, break off of each other. And the membrane in the middle is called a proton exchange membrane, which allows the proton to travel through, but the electron cannot. So the electron's stuck on one side trying to get to its proton and its oxygen, and it can't get through there. But we provide a conductive circuit around the outside. So it finds that, finds its proton friend, the oxygen forms water and goes out the tailpipe. But you get that flow of the electrons going, and that flow creates electric current. So the membrane's the got inky dinky little holes in it that protons can fit through, but electrons, but electrons cannot. cannot. It's not conductive, right? And nature hates instability. Absolutely. And as they want to rejoin that flow of electrons is the electricity that powers the car. It is one of the simplest chemical reactions, and we just introduced the right conditions for it to take place. And these fuel cells are making amazing pro I mean, we've been talking, uh, the three of us journos here have been writing about fuel cells forever, but it looks <laughs> like it's finally starting to really come to happen, at least from a cost standpoint. Absolutely, yeah. And it, it wasn't just uh, the fuel cell itself, but also the components that we've made it to the fuel cell, what we call the balance of plant, that make this the, the reaction happen, the reaction possible, the the decrease in the cost of all those components that have made us able to launch them here, I last. Year. Well, and there was the whole question of how do you store, which was a major st stumbling block for a while, and you did figure out how to, you know, carry enough hydrogen on board that gives you, you said, about 300 mile range. Yes, we have a EPA label for 312 miles. But it was interesting when we first started the vehicles. We were looking at, um, you know, all the automakers were kind of starting to get into the space and, and, and play with fuel cells and hydrogen and do do onboard reformation. But you can imagine having a reformer mm -hmm. on board a vehicle. It's kind of kind of difficult. Um, looked at liquid hydrogen, but it is a cryogenic liquid, so you're dealing with you know, extremely cold temperatures, and how do you transfer that into the vehicle? Um, so we started at about 3,600 psi, which is what CNG vehicles use, and then wanted more range, so up to 5,000 psi. That was still doable, and we said, oh, well, how about 10,000 psi will get us that range that we think the customers really need um, out of a vehicle like this. And, and this vehicle is actually running on public roads now. You know, what, what is the status of this as far as, you know, going from lab to real world a person can, can you know, buy it and fuel it? Mm -hmm. So we did launch it in October last year in the U.S. Uh, it was launched in Japan first, so it's on the road in Japan, um, in Europe, and right now only in California in the U.S. And it's unfortunately because we do have to launch it where there's infrastructure, because you don't want to give someone a car where they can't fill it. That would be pretty... And in this case, infrastructure means someplace where you can buy a tank of, uh, uh, hydrogen. of hydrogen. Yep, someplace yeah. where you can go to a yeah. filling station. Right now, the dispensers are co-located with gasoline, um, except I think maybe one station. No, they're, they're all they're all co-located. So you pull up to where a gasoline retail location is, and there's a hydrogen dispenser, and you pull up very similar to refilling with gasoline. It takes about five minutes, gives you over 300 miles range. Pretty good. And, and these are for normal people, not just for test pilots who are driving these things around? These are for normal people, yeah, and you can uh, buy and lease the Mirai, which mm -hmm. was a first for fuel cell vehicles. You can buy them? You can buy them. I, that I did not know. I thought you could only lease them. That's yeah, pretty interesting. So, um, yeah, we've already got a, a, a bunch of questions come in. Steve B. has this question. You talked about the tank being bulletproof or the tanks. He says, what about the fuel lines? What happens if a line is broken or punctured? That is an excellent question. Uh, the whole system itself gets, so we test the, the, the tanks and the system, the high pressure system, which anything from the receptacle, which is where you connect the nozzle when you refill, to the mid pressure regulator, which is where we step down the pressure to go into the fuel cell stack because it's running at very low pressure. Um, that whole system is called the compressed hydrogen storage system. And we test the whole thing to what's called the global technical regulation. And that is a UN document that gets adopted by Europe, by Japan, and is being adopted by the U.S. And that includes 
all kinds of crazy tests to ensure that um, you know a certain leakage rate of very low permeability is allowed from the system. So that includes you know our, all of our um, materials are selected appropriately for hydrogen. All of the um, fittings are appropriately tightened or the appropriate um, type of connector. Um, but then also the amount of fuel allowed in those lines. So if you were to have some kind of release of one of those lines, say one of those lines was compromised in a crash or something like that, it would be a very, very small volume if you look at the, the inside diameters. Is so really you've got tiny. a shutoff valve somewhere, basically. We also have shutoff valves. That includes requirements for shutoff valves for um, thermally activated pressure relief devices, um, collision safety sensors that will, in a collision, isolate the tank system. So if there is somewhere, some way that the line were to be compromised, it would be a low, low volume, and the solenoid valve is a fail-safe, so fail-shut. So you've smashed, bashed, and crashed this thing, not just simulated it to see oh, no. how it works? Oh, yeah. this, no. This has, this has been through the ringer. <laughs> I've driven the car. It's, uh, in fact, I think our colleague Dennis Seminitis had the best line about it. He said the most remarkable thing about the Mirai is how unremarkable it is. It's my it just, line. Is it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, maybe he stole it from he you. He must but... have. <laughs> <laughs> Trademarked it. <laughs> you should have. But uh, yeah, I mean, so my, I guess that's leading up to a question. You've put these in the hands of consumers. I know they're all going to come back and say we love it. But what are you learning from them that, ooh, maybe we should do this or we could change that? So far, um, definitely the, the majority of the feedback has been we love the car. Uh, I would say that the, the greatest learnings we've had so far is where there's room for improvement in the infrastructure side. Which we knew. Uh, Everybody knew that going in. Right? We we knew that going in. Um, it has it has been a little a little slower to roll out. We've talked about this recently. Uh, the infrastructure has been a little low, slower to roll out than we initially anticipated. But also, um, just things that that we didn't expect the customer to not be familiar with. Because even though it is very similar to fueling with a gasoline station, there are a few subtle nuances that can make the difference between calling the service center and saying, "Hey, I, I can't get hydrogen," or having a real easy transition to be able to fuel the vehicle. So there is a lot more training that we need to do. Um, anything about the car, though? Anything about the car? I, anyone that's familiar, really, with driving a, a Prius or electric vehicle, you know, it, it, I heard this actually great story from um, one of our engineers on the, on the Prius back when it first launched, where, you know, all of the customers started calling when the engine would shut off and freak out, the car, the car is broken, the, engine's, the engine just shut off, what's going on? Um, so I think that people have gotten used to the quiet and the ready on light and, you know, the, the people that are driving the vehicle are already, already really accustomed to electric vehicles. So in that area, in that sense, I don't think we've had any, any kind of strange feedback that we weren't already, already anticipating. Oh, very good. And good for you guys. The storage tanks, how do they compare in terms of the amount of space they take up inside the car uh, to a conventional fuel tank? Uh, well, that's a great question. Uh, Unfortunately, or fortunately, gasoline has an incredibly high volumetric and weight energy density, um, if you look at That's why we uh, use it. Yeah. That's why we use it. It's <laughs> yep. easy to transport. You can put it in a conformable plastic tank. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what the, what the exact correlation would be, um, but it, I can say that these, these do take up quite a bit more space. Yeah, I was thinking, uh, as I recall from a, a previous uh, uh, fuel cell car that, that I drove, it was it, it was a car, which was wonderful. And then you opened up uh, the, I think, hatch in the case of this one, and you saw, oh, yeah, there's a lot of extra space given, you know, dedicated to storing mm -hmm. fuel. So that's still, you know, one of the packaging constraints that you've got with hydrogen. The tanks are still a packaging constraint, yes, especially since they're they're. Cylindrical. You don't have the option you of don't. making them look like saddle bags, like yeah, you, do you with have fuel to design tanks. around them. You can't have yeah. it as an afterthought, like. Not oh, Here's yeah. Nice. PSI. Yeah, 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 exactly. But I mean, the beauty is that this is this car is you know twice as efficient as a gasoline vehicle. So even though you carry less fuel on board, you can get the same. You can get 300 miles yeah. off of less carrying less fuel on board. Okay, we, another question from the audience. Armand wants to know: Is there any regular service that you need to do on a fuel stack, and how long will the stack last? So the stack does have a warranty. Um, we have obviously, we wouldn't bring it to the customer unless we were comfortable that we could meet those expectations and the customer could have the vehicle for life. Uh, it does have the normal maintenance requirements is, um, you know, check your tires, check your brakes, check your windshield washer fluid. There's obviously no oil. Um, I'd say the most unique aspect is there is a, um, ion, a ionic filter that you need to change out that is used for the fuel cell coolant that gets changed out once every three years. But otherwise, you're not dealing with all of those moving parts. You're not dealing with oil changes. It's, it's actually a 
pretty easy car to maintain. And that ionic filter is relatively cheap? It has to be. <laughs> <laughs> What's it look like? I've never seen an ionic filter. Is it like... I don't even you know, know what it is. 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 is it like an air filter? Is it like you know, sliding you know, the air filter into your furnace? Uh, a little different. I mean, we're dealing with removing the ions or changing the charge of the... In this case, we're trying to maintain the isolation resistance of the coolant that's used for the fuel cell stack. So I can show it to you if you want to pop the later. <laughs> but yeah, it just looks like a small cartridge. Okay, go yeah. And so it's not that different and... from changing the toner in your copier. No, and, and luckily it's positioned quite easily for the service guys. So it's not one of those, you know, wonky positions where you have to remove, you know, the battery and this yeah. and that and the other thing to get to like it. Like a BMW so where you have to pull the engine yeah. to change a spark plug. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So, so, so you mentioned Prius. This, this has a lot of Prius in it, doesn't it? Yes, we borrow heavily from our hybrid sisters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, so that, that's helpful in terms of the technology. So there's, there's more confidence that you can put in a hydrogen system because knowing full well that you do have the hybrid synergy drive that's been proven out among how many bazillion Priuses mm -hmm. and and Highlanders and Lexi and whatnot. Over eight million hybrid yeah. vehicles now that we've that we've sold. Yeah, and actually, I mean, this this technology started the development at the same time as the Prius. So this is over 20 years of development that has Man. gone into this vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that it was a different. You know, we're waiting for the right time and the right, right. place and and the conditions and the infrastructure to be there. And so, yeah, that does give us mainly a cost advantage, but also we have a really high confidence in the power control unit in the motor, the electric motor and the battery that we all borrowed from our production vehicles. And so when the Mirai kicked off, wasn't it the chief engineer of the original Prius became the chief engineer for the Mirai? It did. So smart guy knew that he, this was for the future. Yeah. Well, there's be. a lot of smart people that worked on this car. <laughs> <laughs> Including you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jackie, General Motors has said, you know, the reason that, and I, I take this with somewhat of a grain of salt, General Motors has said that the reason it has not put a fuel cell car out there is that the technology is advancing so rapidly right now that anything it would put out on the street would be instantly obsolete. What's the value of Toyota actually having these cars where people can buy or lease them? Well, this is one, this is an application of space in our portfolio that we saw needed to be filled. And that was a zero emission vehicle that was long range and with a quick refueling time. And so we have customers that, that want to drive zero emission vehicles. And this is really the option that fit their lifestyle the best. So for us, this is just one of the offerings of but it's very limited. I, you know, th yeah, this is really a glorified science experiment still, you know, and I'm a not berating it. A, a very good one. No, no, I, I, <laughs> no. I totally get you. But that, that's where I am wondering, what's the, what's the value, because you guys do zillions of miles of testing on this thing. What, what's the value of placing it in the hands of consumers and learning from that? Well, certainly this is, this is one step towards what we hope to be what this Synergy Drive has become, which is across a platform of vehicles. So we can offer this in an SUV platform, in a coupe platform, sports car, um, something that we're introducing to the public and they're getting familiar with, but also then we're learning so much that you, you can't learn from, regardless of how many engineers you have and how many miles that we, we drive it on the road in our test conditions or in the dyno sales. There's just something about getting into the hands of customers that you get all kinds of feedback that you would never otherwise. Can you give us one, for instance, of something that you thought, oh, so glad that the consumer gave us this feedback? Oh, man. Um, I would say most of it we learned from our, our previous generation vehicle, um, which we took all the learnings from the previous generation vehicle into this vehicle. And um, a lot of it was on just the feel of acceleration, how heavy the vehicle was, um, and then things like um, regen, when you're driving down a hill, you know, when you're going down a hill and you have the regen on, and so you feel kind of that, that deceleration, or you don't, you don't feel what's called runaway, where all of a sudden, if the battery is full, then your generator stops kicking on the battery, and then all of a sudden, you feel like your vehicle's accelerating downhill, when really, it's just that you've lost your, your regen. So that's something that we've taken into consideration with this vehicle. So that way, you don't have that. that it feels loss. normal at all times, it not all of a sudden start coasting. Exactly. It's, so when the battery's full, you don't, it doesn't stop regening. And about how many Marais are there on the road you know, today, in California or total globally. around the world, whatever figure you have? Um, I'm not sure about globally. I know yeah. we're ramping up to hundreds in the U.S. Um, we're looking sorry, at thousands, many? hundreds. In Hundreds US, in the U.S.? Up to thousands. Wow. That's, the for the end of That's the year. a lot we're for a car for... like this. Yeah. No, well, come on. They're making the Motomachi plant. That's a high production plant. Come <laughs> on. They're just spitting these things out. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, it's a production plant. It's a full production plant. <laughs>
Okay, we got another question here. Bob Wilson, uh, you, you talked about the pressure of the tank. He wants to know, what about the internal pressure of the operating fuel cell? For example, does the air have to be compressed before feeding it in? Yes, um, it's at a very low pressure, uh, but it is pressurized. We have to maintain the partial pressure of the oxygen and the hydrogen to get the kind of electrochemical reaction we're looking for to maintain power, but also because the fuel cell is internally humidified. And that's a, a first in industry, first no other automaker. What's that mean? Has done that, that it's humidified. So, uh, in order for the proton to hop across the membrane, like we talked about before, the stack has to be humidified. So it's a low temperature fuel cell because obviously, if you go above boiling point, it's no longer humidified. But um, usually, you have an external humidifier that provides a certain amount of water to the stack to maintain those right operating temperatures. Um, for us, uh, a, a cost reduction me measure and a challenge given to us by the chief engineer was to remove the external humidifier. So the brilliant minds in Japan came up with this way of monitoring you know, the, the airflow rate, what we're putting in with the hydrogen, and what we call the impedance, and being able to measure how much water was in the cell or model how much water was in the cell based on that to maintain the appropriate water levels. Um, what that means, though, is that if it starts to get too wet, we'll need to kick up that compressor and blow the water out so we need to have the capability to control the oxygen and the, the flow of the, of the oxygen to the fuel cell stack. If it starts to dry out too much, you need to kick that down, let more water start to accumulate on the cathode, and then it's created on the cathode side, and then it has, through the, design, the flow field that was designed in Japan, the water is able to go back over to the anode side and, and keep the whole membrane humidified. So speaking of all this water, what happens when you guys go from California to all Duluth? <laughs> is, is, the, is the fuel cell going to be frozen and not be able to work? No, there is uh, adaptive logic, and that actually was a big, a big discussion point previously with fuel cells was, oh, they, they freeze, they can't start up in freezing temperatures, but they do, and they can, and we actually had an easier time with our fuel cell vehicle in Yellowknife, Canada, than we did with our rentals. But, um, <laughs> 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 but um, it does have a logic that it'll, it'll spool up, and the, with using the air compressor, it'll kick out all of the water, and then if you remove the water, then obviously you alleviate the freezing condition, mm -hmm. and... And so obviously, a fuel cell car will not lose range in the winter. No, we don't. Unlike we, battery cars, we can which use, we can use the heat. a substantial mm -hmm. reduction in range. Yep, that is a, a big benefit because we are creating heat along with the water, and we are able to use that heat to, to warm the cabin instead of having to have an hmm. additional electric heater. Why is this not called an electric car, though? I mean, it is an electric car, but you just don't plug it in, right? I actually call it the electric vehicle unplugged, so you set me up for that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it is an electric car. Um, I'm not sure why why it's not, why battery electric is mainly, when you hear electric vehicle, everyone associates that with battery electric. But for us, since we offer all of these solutions, we call it battery electric, fuel cell electric. But you have a well, battery in there, right? We do have a battery in there as well, yeah. I mean, be, besides the 12-volt battery that's yes, running yeah, the, the yeah. normal. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the... BEV versus PCV, right? Uh, uh, or FCV, 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 excuse me, right? Yeah. Fuel cell vehicle yes. versus battery electric vehicle. Yeah, and they did. Uh, there was a time where they were trying to do FCEV, fuel cell electric vehicle. I don't know. Well, that's, that's what you guys <laughs> called the Highlander when the Highlander was rolling around. It that was, was an FCHV. That was a fuel cell hybrid vehicle. Okay. Because we wanted to, to take into account exactly what you mentioned, the battery that we also have on board. But I think a lot of people have trouble... It's part of the, the beauty of introducing the hybrid was people got used to this idea of the battery. But then once we said fuel cell hybrid, it's like, oh, well, there's also a gasoline. Are you also, you know, is there an engine in there? It's like, right. yes, it's engine, but it's a fuel cell engine. So is, is there any, there's no fire. There's no spark. There's no pistons. So there is a, um, it's good that, under, that there's an understanding of what hybridization means. But then you realize it doesn't, hybridization doesn't just mean gasoline and battery. It can mean fuel cell and battery. Forgot to ask. So you can buy it or you can lease it. What's it cost? Uh, it's fifty-seven thousand five hundred before the incentives. And that's what seventy-five hundred dollars. Yes, credit? and Is then that... they just reinstated it. That's for California, and then also reinstated. I think eight thousand dollars on the federal level. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. That was just reinstated last December. So you're looking at fifteen thousand five hundred dollars total incentives, at least in California, yes. for this. Mm -hmm. And what's the lease price? It's you know? four ninety-nine a month. Okay. And that does include for um, a certain amount of customers uh, the fuel, since we're still in the early stages of, of figuring out the fueling infrastructure. So it's a way to help kind of get our, our early adopters on board, the people that are taking this journey with us as we're starting to 
roll out more infrastructure, we'd like to have them have more options of where to go, where to drive the vehicles, um, redundant stations in their neighborhoods and things like that. So and, is, and is it available more. in Southern California and San Francisco or just Southern California? Sacramento, Bay Area, and Los Angeles. Uh, we've got several questions coming in. Uh, Dan the man, Mitchell, they, they <laughs> all about uh, infrastructure. <laughs> Mitchell wants to know, have you considered installing hydrogen fueling stations at each Toyota dealership until the rest of the country catches up? At each Toyota dealership? Yeah. Um, I cannot say that I know of any plans to have done that. I can't say that we have in California in our, our eight dealerships that we have selected to be Mirai dealerships. Um, that we have a, a, what's called a mobile fueler, which is kind of a real um, kind of toned down version of a hydrogen station to ensure that the customers have fuel just in case one of the, their local stations does go down. Mm -hmm. So we do have mobile fuelers ready that we can deploy, and those are what we use when we do our testing because obviously there's no hydrogen in Death Valley or Yellowknife Canada or any of those, so we take these mobile stations with us. So that could be an option, but... Um, are these giant trucks, like they have giant tanks, like be a version of these tanks exactly just driving around like that. They do, yeah actually that's how we got we got busted by a spy photographer in death valley because we were driving around the car and nobody really knew what it was until we pulled up to the hydrogen trailer it said hydrogen on the side <laughs> <Surprise>. <laughs> yep yeah yeah so we got we got busted on that one <laughs> mike ma from san francisco wants to know uh what's toyota's vision for hydrogen is it going to power everything are we going to see full-size cars cuvs trucks and the next five, ten to five to ten years. So we are. Uh, we have announced plans to um, start to roll out about thirty thousand vehicles a year in twenty twenty. That's a lot. That is. I mean, for for this technology, that's a lot. Yes. That would be globally, I assume. Yes, yeah. and 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 the beauty there being that you know fuel cells can be scaled down to be small enough to power your cell phone or large enough to power your facility. We have a one point one megawatt fuel cell on the Toyota campus in Los Angeles, so there's a lot of opportunity there for. You know, anything from, you know, buses down to compact cars. So you could see it across the entire lineup. Um, we also have what's called the high grid, this kind of image of integrating hydrogen into the grid. So you have the, you know, renewable electricity generation that you then feed to your plugins. Then you also have hydrogen as a storage from, you know, biogas or um, from electrolyzers in certain situations where it's all based on whatever your domestic, local, renewable energy source is. You feed the grid and you feed the, the high grid, the hydrogen pipelines as well, and are able to power your vehicles based on, you know, whatever vehicle you're driving. If you're driving the Prius Prime or you're dri driving the Mirai. Do you drive one yourself? Our group has a few that we have the pleasure of taking home, yes. Uh -huh. So I do. I take one home whenever I get the opportunity. That's great. <laughs> and we were talking about the exhaust being you know, just water, basically. But most people have never seen it. I mean, can you describe it? It's a trickle of water coming out of the you know, exhaust pipe, right? And it's, it's not hot or anything. It's, I mean, d tell them what, what is the exhaust. If you owned one of these, what would you see? It is. So since it's, as I, as I talked about, it is a low temperature fuel cell. So it has to be humidified. So the, the water itself is in liquid form. It's less than 100 degrees, obviously, so you can you can touch it. You can put your hand under it and, and feel it. Can those. you drink it? We don't recommend drinking it. <laughs> um, um, and it's a very small amount. It's not it like a, 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 an open tap coming out of it. No, the, that was my the, question. Yeah. You it's, know, just, it's, it's just drops. It'd be a good thing yeah. for California, though, yeah. if it were. You know, I mean, it'd be <laughs> there you go. It's actually the same water. amount that comes out of an ICE, out of a normal gasoline combustion engine. Interesting. But because yeah. it's at a much lower temperature, it comes yeah. out in a liquid form, so it's a lot more, it's, it's visible, whereas yeah. in the, in the, here, you, never here touch, in the cold you would climate. never touch a, you know, the tailpipe sure. of a gasoline. And it also is what affords us um, the plastic covers that we have underneath the vehicle, because there's no hot gases being exhausted. So we can cover the entire underbody of the vehicle, which improves the aerodynamics, improves the road noise. So it kind of sounds like a Lexus. It drives like a Lexus. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, uh, here in the in the cold parts of the country in the winter, we see the water coming out mm -hmm. of the exhaust pipe of yes. the internal combustion engine. Yes. And that was my question uh, to the Toyota people uh, earlier was, uh, what if we have millions of these cars on the road and they're all dropping water down and in the winter it freezes? <laughs> And they were like, no, 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 no. It's the same that comes out of a gasoline engine. Yes, that's correct. And millions of fuel cells on the cars. We'll worry about that in 24. I did the math. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I did the math on that in one show. Yeah, though, really? yeah. Oh, we yeah, did, yeah we, you we, did. And no, you we, did we broke right it all here. down, so we're, we're, you're, you're fine. <laughs> not, not to worry at yeah, all. Yeah. 
Okay, I just, I'll just let you guys answer all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, so does Toyota have a, a, an expectation for when there will be an infrastructure that allows fuel cell vehicles to be sold throughout a country? I mean, America's big, so you know, maybe not here, but is there some place that you're looking at and you're saying, hey, in you know, Belgium, you know, we think there will be a full network of fuel cells by this time. Is, is there a forecast at all, or are you waiting for that end of the economy to take care of itself? Uh, well, we're, de we're actually very involved with that with that end of things as well. Which I mean, we're obviously not we're not an infrastructure company. We're a car company. Well, we're a mobility company. So we do all all kinds of things beyond just the vehicle. But we are working so closely with um, you know with governments, with academia, with other automakers to help roll out this infrastructure. And right now, the places that are really leading the way are California, Japan, and Germany. And they do all have plans of of these networks of stations that if you place them, if you optimize the placement of the stations, where they're close to freeways, where um, you know you think the customers are going to be, the people that are that are going to buy these vehicles, then you really don't need as um, involved as a, of a gasoline, as the gasoline infrastructure is right now. You don't need as many gasoline stations. So like in, in California, um, through all these studies and through you know route optimization and looking at vehicles miles, miles traveled and traffic patterns, uh, it came out to be 68 stations to support 10,000 fuel cell vehicles, which is throughout the entire state. Throughout the entire state. Great. And uh, so similar studies have pricing. been done. They're they're what uh, a couple of million bucks to put in one of them, right? Less than a couple million, yes, yeah. Okay, but they're about a million, five about a million <laughs> yeah, yeah, right about a, right around a million um, yeah. to put in the stations right now. So they they are pricey, but again, if you when you put one in, you can fill a vehicle every five minutes, right? And so you get in and you can support not only us but the other automakers with their launches as well. Right. So Hyundai's got vehicles out there, and yep. and Honda's got vehicles out there, and. Uh, mm -hmm. And aren't you doing something in the East Coast as well in the United States? That, yeah, well, uh, Air Liquide actually just made the announcement of the first, I think, four locations that they'll be um, placing. But we did partner with Air Liquide to put stations in the Northeast states to support rollout in, you know, New York, New Jersey, that, mm -hmm. that part of the, the U.S. as well. So we do see it kind of as a, um, you know, you start on the coast and, and work your way in. Um, and is there but, a time frame for when that complete network that, make the, that covers all of California might be in place? We uh, expect to have a, a pretty robust n network by the end of next year, but by 2020, by the next uh, launch, is really the target to have a, a really robust San network. Diego to the Oregon line. We should have San Diego before then, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, all the way to, to Oregon. And, it's, and it, it, we have the benefit of you know, the hydrogen infrastructure already being in, in place in California. There's already pipelines. We already have um, you know, hydrogen plants all over and, you know, trucks that are transporting hydrogen over the road every day. You know, same with Texas. They have a very robust infrastructure, hydrogen inf infrastructure there. So it's really just about getting the dispenser in the ground and getting the hydrogen into the vehicle. Okay. Great. Jackie, with that, we're going to have to wrap it up. But this has been Already? Fantastic. I know. Can you believe it? We just burned through a half hour like that. I can't believe it just happened. I know. No. But uh, you've been terrific. This is an exciting development. You can, know. I, can I take care of one more thing before, go, please, before I go? Please. Okay. Well, we we brought you, <laughs> we brought you a gift. Hoping oh my that gosh! You would be able to so add I'm gonna it. open it right here so everybody can see. Oh, this is great. So we've got a model, uh, <laughs> a little scale model of a Toyota Mirai, okay. and it's going to go up on the shelves here. So oh, we're going to put perfect. a fuel cell because we don't have any fuel cell cars. We have autonomous cars. We have ancient cars. We've got race cars. We've got hybrids. We've got plug-ins. We don't have a fuel cell one, so thank you. Now you do. For the Mirai. Yeah. <laughs> Jackie, thanks so much again thank for coming so much on for the show. Me. That's great. Thanks, thanks, guys. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to be right back. We're going to be talking about some of the news of the week. Don't go away. And uh, we've also got Dr. Data. <laughs> and it's time for Dr. Data. Okay, so we've been talking on the show, I think we did last week and a couple of weeks before that, about Gen Z. In cars. And the argument, we started with the Kelly Blue Book Auto Trader research that seemed to indicate that, oh, yeah, they're going to be buying cars left, right, and center. And Gen Z defined that. And, and this would be the, the people who are 16 and less in age. 16 and younger. Right. Okay. And, and I'm a little skeptical about this whole thing. I, I think there's going to be a change. I don't think the industry is going to be as robust as it was when 
say the three of us were growing up and cars were something that were something that we really, 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 really wanted to have. So, because you, you, the, the Kelly Blue Book data shed, hey, you know, Gen Z, they're different than Gen X and Gen Y. They want cars. Right. So, I happened to find some information from the Federal Highway Administration. And Carmen, can you show this, please? Here okay. are people 16 years old or younger with driver's licenses in the U.S., and the chart shows fewer and fewer and fewer so, getting so their license. And so, so in 2009, that number is 1.72 million, and in 2014, it's 1.08 million. So, I mean, look at, look at that track. Right. Fewer young people getting their driver's license. What do you think, Mark? License. I honestly think that people under 16 with their driver's license are such a small, weird sample that I don't know what to make of them. Frankly, I mean, plus. Well, this is 16 and younger, so this would be that when you were 16 years old, what was okay, the first thing you did? 16 and younger. So that the first thing you okay. did was that's interesting to get a driver's yeah. license, right? So, yeah. so they're just yeah. saying that in other states, yeah. you know, some yeah. states you yeah. can be 15 yeah. to get a license. And I assume that includes the you know ways that a lot of states are you know making people wait until they're graduated older to get graduated know, driver's licenses. licenses that's and all, like that's that. all right. factored into that. I assume that's an interesting figure. So it doesn't look good. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, I tend to fall into the category that, you know, un, until America becomes, you know, a country that believes in mass transit and supports infrastructure, people will need cars. Right. Um, th there will be certainly marginal changes around Uber what they drivers. need, how they need, whether Uber exists, whether Uber has drivers anymore, for sure. <laughs> um, That's a good point. But I mean, I mean, They'll all uh, go to Lyft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, autonomous vehicles... And ride sharing seemed like a perfect match. You know, call the empty vehicle and it takes you where you want to go. So I, I, I feel like th there are changes coming. I'm not on the apocalyptic end of the scale when I think about what the changes will be. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of along. It, it's going to be a gradual transition. It's not going to happen overnight. But I take it out 20 years, you're going to see big impact. So if we take that line and go 20 years, even yeah. if it's at an incremental decrease. Well, at, at that point, but we'll have autonomous a, cars. You won't need a exactly. driver's license. Do you need a license to call an Uber? No. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that's, that's, our, that's our number for, for the week. Very good. Very interesting. So what else is going on, Gary? You had made a so, list so of speak, things. So speaking there. of numbers, did you see the um, Ford has opened up the uh, the subscription for um, putting yourself on the list to get a Ford GT? And uh, so for all of you out there, you can go to FordGT.com right now. And put your name on it. Put your name on the list. Get one. <laughs> and, uh, is, is it sold out already? I don't know, but, I, but if it hasn't, honestly, I'd be surprised. I, 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 was, surprised. I was surprised when I saw the number, though, what they're saying you know, an average price, $450,000, yep. and it's going to be only 500 vehicles. Yeah. And you do the math on that. So if just an average price, it'd be like $225 million worth of... Uh, of revenue? I still wouldn't count on, it, on, on them to make money on it, though. Really? <laughs> I, I doubt they're going to lose their shirts. No, but, and, but and, you're right. You it's have a halo give, car, and you have to give it. It's not just a halo car; it's a research car. True. Because I mean, the right. real benefits of that car are going to be the carbon fiber, the, what they learn how to do with carbon fiber, and a whole host of other everything else they build. That, that and, gorilla and, glass. Exactly. So I mean, it's a car that will pay off in a lot of other ways. Uh, but uh, um, I, I would hope that my bonus wasn't tied to that particular profit line on that car <laughs> yeah. if I was a Ford executive. <laughs> But to your point, Gary, I think uh, what the point you wanted to shouldn't Ford have charged? Yeah, do a do a, a uh, do an Elon Musk exactly and say, instead of make it a ten thousand dollar deposit. Yeah, but that money isn't really yours until you deliver the car. I mean, you know, if you look at Tesla, they show that you know, all of those thousand dollar deposits mm -hmm. show up in their books as liabilities. You, you know, you you don't have that money to do with whatever you want. No, but you got so, a pile of cash. You can yeah. do stuff with it no matter what the book well, says. And if you're Elon, you, you get a great press release out of it. So maybe that's just the You point. get a series of press releases yeah. out of it. But even more just, than that, yeah. you, you can take that money and pay for tooling on it. Yeah, so, so basically it, 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 it shows up. It, 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 isn't, it isn't income. It is a liability, but it is a pile of cash. But it's a pile of cash. It's a pile of yeah. cash that cash you can, is king. That you yes. can use for, for your purposes, be they. And if you're Ford, there's no way you're not going to have enough money to repay it. Worst comes to worst. Elon, you know, 325,000 people each giving him you know, $1,000. I, I don't know that he'd be able to cover that check if he had to. <laughs> he, he didn't tell them when they're getting that car. Yes. Yeah. Just, yeah. They're, they're getting that car. Yeah. But it's sort of interesting that... Um, 
and, and you guys reported on in, on daily about this um, about how the Model S has had a had a refresh, the, yeah. the new front end. New front end. Look, I love the Model X and the front end that they have on it. I never was a. I'm a fan of the Model S, but just not that front end grill. It's the only ugly part of the car in my eye. And so they they cleaned up the front end with the X. Now they've done it. And here we got the the picture of the the Model S with the that new front end on it. And I believe the Model 3 is going to get it because to, well, the, to me, the Model 3 looks so unfinished yes. in the front end. And that's one of the things that's very controversial about the 3 right now, mm -hmm. the, the odd-looking nose and, and the very spare interior. Mm -hmm. And both of those, so there's, I think, there's are going to change. the Model 3. Yeah. yeah, and see how unfinished yeah, that, looks like a that ghost. front yeah. yeah, I'm sure it's going to get it. But yeah. Do so you think they'll have that little cutout, that little yeah. that little mustache-like cutout on the uh, up? The, so the lower grill will be there, but just something on the, yep, on the that, top that, fascia, just the and that leading edge. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sure, you want a family resemblance. It's like the kidney grid that you know BMW has had uh, uh, f forever, mm -hmm. even though it uh, it's evolved over time. But yeah, why not have that family resemblance? I think it would really make the three look much better. You know, and I think one of the interesting things though is is that. Here's the car company that, if we were to go back not that many years, many of us would have predicted it would have been gone, non-existent. And here they're doing a mid-cycle refresh. I mean, that's like, wow. They've, well, you got to, you know. And, but, and, I mean, and, they've, been a lot, they've been around sufficiently long to make that happen. Yes. That's the thing that's, right. I think, no, surprising. No, no, that's, that's a great point. But the other thing, too, is, you know, at least according to Ward's statistics, sales of the Model S are down 40% in the U.S. for the first three months of the year. 40% is a huge drop. Now, I don't know if that means they're allocating production to other markets in the world. Maybe it is. But uh, time for a mid-cycle refresh. Yeah. Well, plus, the, there's a new model that all the buzz is around, too. I mean, the, the X. So, I mean, it makes sense. At, at some point, if you're going to be a business, you have to start behaving like a business. Mm. And, and you know, refresh it and you know, make sure that you're not sca scavenging your own, cannibalizing your own buyers. Mm hmm very true. You know, you, you were mentioning, Mark, about how um, with the Ford GT that if you worked at Ford, you wouldn't want to have your bonus tied to that. Uh, it was interesting that the uh, reporting came out of, of, of Germany that uh, the German executives at Volkswagen may have to take a 30% cut of their bonuses. Boy, they got a hell of a nerve taking any bonus at all, don't they? <laughs> I mean, honestly. Well, you know, honestly, but think about it. What if you're somebody who has nothing to do with powertrain in Volkswagen? Let, let's say you're somebody who's not even in Germany, but we're and let's say you've done a bang-up job of running your operation. But what they're talking about isn't, you know, the, the you know, guy in charge of the plant in Puebla, Mexico, taking a cut. This is board-level executives taking, you know, talking about, gee, should I have to take a cut or not? And the board-level, yes, I think that... They well, look, are, if they are going to ask they everybody else for cuts, I totally agree. Yeah. But it, to me, it's, it's unfair that, you know, if I did a great job running my operation and somebody else in powertrain screwed up, why should I have to give Tough up luck. my bonus? You, you work for a company that broke the rules and it's paying tens of billions of dollars. You know, I, I mean, where's it? the money's got to come from someplace. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just... Yeah. <laughs> arguing for arguing sake. I actually agree with you. <laughs> so, okay, but Mark, you think they should have zero the, the, versus the, the, any percentage? The board? The, the supervisory board? Absolutely. They're called the supervisory board. What were they supervising? And, 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 and part of the problem, frankly, is they are the supervisory board, and what have they done to alleviate or address this problem in the nine months since it became public? Like they still nothing. don't have a plan, and that's what I think is, is, is unforgivable. I mean, that's, you know, sure, they should have known something fishy was going on, but I can understand if they didn't, but this has been in their lap mm -hmm. for nine months, and... Do they have an agreement with the U.S.? Have they told owners what they're going to do? No, they got an extension because they still exactly. can't figure it out. They've got no no route out of this yet. In fact, and that's what they should. Isn't have it done. next week they got to have the answer? It wasn't it April twenty one that they have to. Uh... But I believe they've got an extension from that. But I could be wrong. No, about no, that. no. I, yeah. I, I, they, they had like it was March twenty one yes. was the first one, and the, the judge said, "Okay, I'll give you yeah. another month," and that's it. Oh, and and they've said I think the latest is, the, is they've said they don't expect to be able to announce anything then, and the judge may have said in that case I'm going to set a trial date, which will be another yeah. three or four month extension, basically. Yeah. <laughs> right. So they're going to buy a whole bunch of cars back, or they're going to plant a whole lot of trees. What do you think? Uh, Honestly, 
I, 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 I don't even want to waste time trying to think of what I think they should do at this point. I just want them to do their job. What do you think is going to happen, Gary? I don't think they're going to buy cars back. I think they're going to have some sort of software patch that will cause the vehicles to meet the requirements, but the vehicles will not have the same f performance that they did previously. Remember when we first were talking about this and Harry Payne was going on and on and on about uh, how, how it was so much fun to drive and, and so exhilarating and so on and so forth. I, don't, I, I think Henry's going to be disappointed when, when they have the software patch for his car. And how and, much will that cost them in lawsuits from owners? A lot Probably more. A yeah. lot. A lot more. Yeah. You know, but that's a good point, Mark. I hadn't thought of it. Because I, I believe they're going to buy them back. I, I, I think, think that uh, EPA but, okay, and Okay, they're going to buy them. Are they going to buy them back for the price that they would exist? I mean, what's the price in the used car they're, market they're now? There is no price. They're going to buy them back at, at, at uh, book value plus a premium for all the headache of us having to take your car back. I, I think that they're going to have to pay a premium in buying those cars back. Okay, so if somebody has a diesel Volkswagen that is one of the ones that violates it, mm -hmm. and they bought it for, let's say, $18,000, and let's say they've had this car for two years. So are you suggesting they're going to get about mm, 13 for this car? No, I'm going to say that, you know, the, uh, uh, Volkswagen or whoever the intermediary is. Whatever ALG the, the, says The company doing worth. the remediation is going to say, yeah, what's ALG or Kelly Blue Book or Black Book? They say with this year, with this many models, uh, it, your car is worth this. So we're going to pay you that plus another $2,500 on top of it. Yeah. That's where I think it's going to And happen. one other question. What if... You know, some of these people don't want to sell their cars. Well, in states that have emissions testing, you're going to have to do something to bring it into compliance. Yep. But most states don't have testing. Right. So if you love your TDI, yeah. you're probably going to keep it until the wheels fall off. Yeah. Because or the resale of it is not going to be... A or possible. there's going to be you know, a court order that says Volkswagen has to get it back and, from and you in some fashion. And you can never bring it back to the dealer. Right. Because the dealers will be legally responsible to make that car compliant or pull it off the road. Yeah. So don't bring your TDI back to the yeah. dealer. And, and, if you and want there, to keep it. Exactly. And, and there will be owners I'll in that case who are even angrier. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because they wanted to keep the car and they weren't allowed to. So, I mean, it's just, it, it's a hall of they mirrors. Get a per personalized license plate that says, I don't care. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You'll have to peel my fingers, my cold, <laughs> my cold dead, dead fingers <laughs> from the, uh, the wheel steering wheel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, so um, we were talking about infrastructure before. I thought uh, interesting Ford announcing this week that they're going to spend uh, a billion bucks to improve the. Well, they didn't put a price. Good on for them. But for, somebody estimated it's a billion. One point two is the estimate that's out there. Right. Is it? Yeah, yeah one point two billion. Said, yeah. I think it's going to be good for them. So, so for those who don't know, they're going to. Yeah. So, so basically, right now, Ford has its headquarters, which is on the east side of the Southfield. Freeway, freeway but the on Michigan we're Avenue now are the uh, renderings the for the new, will look but not the headquarters. This is the renderings of the new engineering center. And so this is this would be across the street from the Greenfield, Greenfield Village, Village right? Yeah, yeah. And and this is, I mean, everybody who follows the industry carefully probably has heard of the GM Tech Center a million times. Big modern campus. All the buildings work together. Where GM's done all of its engineering since 1950, folks. Uh, Ford has had much more of a hodgepodge of buildings. They're all in the same area, but they're not connected. They're they not just as efficient. Had built up over the years. Yeah. Whereas the GM campus, which was opened in the late 50s, in fact, President Eisenhower came to the dedication. That's the kind of influence the automotive industry used to have. But anyway, it was designed by Eero Saarinen. Very famous Finnish designer. On the National and, Historic and it designed Red Ranger. it as a campus, not just yep. here's a cool building and here's a cool mm -hmm. building and here's a cool building. But it, I, I, in some and ways, GM's it was putting the... a billion dollars into refurbishing that. And, and if you think about the you know hundreds of millions of dollars that Toyota is spending on its tech center in Ann Arbor, right. this is a good time to be in technical development at a car company and a really good time to be a, a, a major contractor for real estate in, in Southeast mm -hmm. Michigan. No question about it. I thought, I thought, I thought it, was, it, was, it was good and encouraging to see Ford say, you know what, we're going to take, take our heritage and build on it rather than, rather than saying, you know what, 
we're becoming a mobility supplier as well. And uh, you know, the weather really is nice out there in uh, Silicon Valley. And so we're gonna we're gonna stay in we're gonna stay Port, in Dearborn. Port, but boy, we're gonna we're gonna build this magnificent thing out there. Yeah, Ford's always been an incredibly good corporate citizen of, of Dearborn. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, they they have tended that town very carefully over the years. Mm -hmm. Plus. You know, building these campuses, but the GM and Ford are both doing, and like you said, add that on to the, you know, the mega place that Toyota's built here, going to be a great recruiting tool. Mm -hmm. You know, when you come and you see, oh my God, if I walk from one building to the other, it's like taking a stroll through the park, and mm -hmm. there's going to be basketball courts and baseball diamonds and have autonomous and vehicles to take people from one to the other, and right. electric bikes that you can pick up to go from one and building GM's to talk another. Fame. In fact, exactly. GM probably will beat Ford to the punch yep. with autonomous cars and electric bikes on its campus. And that's part of what's fascinating, because it is Ford leapfrogging really from, from this hodgepodge of buildings that you described to absolute modernity. They're, they're sort of, you know, they, they have been hamstrung by the fact that they've got people, you know, who have to there run from like one building to another. There's like 70 buildings, right. And they're it's crazy. all over, not even just Dearborn, but Allen Park and, and other right. neighboring communities. This mm -hmm. is going to be a massive improvement for Ford. And as you started to say, that when they're done with that in 2021, I think it is, they start another campaign to rebuild and expand the headquarters campus and bring in more faci uh, facilities there. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's a massive program. Mm -hmm. And I, I like that, you know, because the headquarters, the, the glass, glass house, house, as everybody knows its nickname, you know, was built in the mid-50s, and it was kind of a very modern design for the day. Today, it no longer looks modern, and some of the renderings that they put out of how they're just going to change a bit of the facade of that building dramatically brings it into the 21st century. And, and the building itself, they continue to use. And, and they're expanding and adding other stuff around it, of course. But it's not a, a teardown or anything. As you were saying, it, it's really honoring their heritage. Yeah, because, I mean, it is kind of classical design, even though to our eyes now, being a half a century or more older, 60 years older, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad they're keeping it. But freshening, yeah, mid-cycle refresh. Exactly. <laughs> and it's it's yeah. a hell of a cycle. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, but think about it. You know, it, it'll look good for the next 60 years mm -hmm. or thereabouts. Yeah. And I hadn't thought about the recruiting tools, but you're right about that, too. I mean, ha having all of there, there's such a huge concentration of technical and engineering talent in this area anyway. But it's, it's hard to get people to, you know, leave, you know, Silicon Valley you know, for a brick building in Dearborn. And this is going to give them something that, that will make it a lot easier to compete. You know, what I wonder about is, is you know, and you guys are probably familiar with this, the engine engineering building that is, um, would be the north, it would be on, on Oakwood. Yeah. But, but north of the, the Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. Yeah. Right. I mean, just a, a magnificent building from Oh, it is, the from 20s. the 1920s. Yeah, I mean, and it's great architecture. And I mean, I hope they keep that. I hope that that becomes to, part yeah. of that, They've got that to, campus they, rather than don't you know, knock saying, it down. Yeah, saying right. okay, whatever is on the, what would that direction be? The um, west side of, of Oakwood where the product development center is now and the science labs are now, yep. that that's, that's going to be the campus. Well, the, across the street, that maybe, building, you know, it, it, it to the Henry Ford organization and let them do something with it. Because, you know, they, they, they're pretty badly landlocked as it is. Mm -hmm. They, uh, but that building that Gary's talking about, that goes, Henry Ford kept his office there. Did he? Really? Yes, he did. Right. I mean, he had several offices, but he spent most of his time there because th their old headquarters was over by, uh, on, on Ford Rotunda, and it was this great palatial Italianate design. It was a beautiful building. Today, you drive, you wouldn't even know there was a building there today. Mm -hmm. It's just a field. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, that, and it used to be known as the double E building, too. Uh, not for electrical engineering, but right. for engine engineering. Right. But Henry used to keep an office there, and it too, uh, architecturally, is reminiscent of the old headquarters building. So it's got this Italianate look. It's got the you know the the curved uh, terracotta tiles mm. on the roof and all that sort of thing. And supposedly, uh, and I've I've read about this. Henry's office overlooked the parking area, and, and he could see who's coming in and out of the building. And if somebody there was coming go. in, he didn't want to deal with, he'd open the window and step out. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody would say, yo, go right into Mr. Ford's uh, office. He's waiting for you. And they'd go in, and there's nobody there. <laughs> and I wonder if Joseph Heller used that in Catch-22 with uh, Major, 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 who used to go outside his window when somebody would come into his office <laughs> to see him. Could be, could be that's where it, it came from. Speaking of the biggest non 
story coming out of out of Ford this week, I thought was the story of that they did the uh, autonomous driving in the dark. It's like. Do we really think that our robot masters need eyes like we do to drive, <laughs> that, that they need so lights? So I just said, Gary, they put out a release about this? Or? No, they made a big deal out of it, that we, we were able to uh, drive around in the dark. And it's just like, okay, so, so you know, cameras that you're using for autonomous vehicles or, or even, you know, cruise control, you really don't need light. And LiDAR systems, they don't but, need to be in our spectrum. But reading the street markings is one of the still big tricky things going on and, you and it's do more it in tricky the you know, with weather uh, no no but the, but the fact that they have at least you know figured out that now, how to now do it in the dark is a step it's not a huge step i, I think i'd agree with you i i, I would not i, th know, I think it's i think it's, i think for this i think it's just that we think that these systems need to i mean you know computer vision is not human vision and you know machine vision is not uh, you know, they, they, it can look at binary and say, oh, that's what it is. And, it, you know, we need images makes us feel better. I just thought that was one of the sorts of things like it, it is kind of silly. You're right. I mean, it's autonomous. These things can see through just about anything. Nonetheless, having said that, there's so much misinterpretation and misinformation or lack of information on the part of the public. They don't get with us. I, I, I talk to people even within the industry and they go, well, we can only have autonomy when 100 percent of the cars are autonomous. And it's like, no, 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 we don't have to wait that long. We can get going now. So even for Ford to come out and say, hey, we've been testing it in the light in the public arena, people are going to go, oh, OK, good. So I. I no matter how silly it seems to us, I think from a public standpoint, you got to put out all this information. We're testing in the snow. We're testing in the rain. We're testing at night. We're testing in, in every situation possible just to get the public used to the fact that, yeah, these cars will be able to deal with anything. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that the, some parts of the industry approached the, the you know, government and said, and let's not rush quite so much. Let's be sure that we know how to do all of this stuff and, and that we have standards in place you know, be, before we start offering it. I think that's a good idea, too. I, you know, I, I think it's a semi-good idea. And the only reason I say not is because we know these cars are going to save lives. If we know that right now today... Over 100 people are going to get killed in the United States in motor vehicle accidents. And tomorrow, another 100. And the day after that, another 100. So when I, every leave, when I leave the studio, I'm walking. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, yeah, th these cars are not going to be perfect. And people are going to get in accidents with autonomous cars. And they're going to get killed in autonomous cars. And we've got to be very open and frank about talking like that. But instead of 35,000 people getting killed every year... It might only be 5,000. And to say, oh, well, 5,000 people got killed in those cars. I'm saying, so what? And we're wringing our hands saying, oh, is this technology ready? And oh, by the way, who's going to sue whom when these things fail? And I'm saying we lose by waiting. Every day we delay in bringing this technology forward, we're sacrificing lives. And so let's not make perfect cars the enemy of really really good cars well and you can have so much improved safety before you get to anything that approaches full autonomy too True. i mean True. automatic braking lane departure assist just little things like that when you think about how much that will help matters particularly for inexperienced you know, drivers you know for kids who are the ones who are most likely to get distracted or run to something they haven't dealt with before and, and get in over their heads and, and i mean those systems well before full autonomy and, and this, they're going to make a huge this difference. is why i love the new attitude at nitsa and i i think more mark rosekind is really bringing in and who's the guy anthony fox at uh, mm -hmm. dot right I, I think they're doing the right thing they're saying hey look we got to figure out a way of bringing this technology to market much much faster so instead of saying we're going to regulate automated braking and blind spot and cross traffic alert and all that kind of stuff why don't you get together with us automakers and let's we're all gonna you know uh cross our hearts and hope to die and we're going to make this stuff standard by 2022 and then what toyota do they announced they're they're going to make it standard next year so Again, I like that attitude, and I like Mark Rosekind saying, hey, look, uh, we got to get out with some sort of overlying rule for autonomous cars from a federal level because we know you guys don't want 50 different sets of regulations in every single state. And to me, it's thrilling to hear Washington, D.C. regulators saying, 
come on, let's all get together and figure out how we're going to bring this technology much faster to the market. Because if we rely on the traditional rules writing yeah. process, it's going to take forever. I, I, I keep, I know I'm a broken record on this, but I keep coming back to the 1970s. It's a, re that's a record. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, how it took years to get NHTSA to agree to go from round headlights to square height headlights. I, I think the rule writing process took almost five years to be but, able to do and, that. And it all, is, it, it all speaks to an attitude that goes back at least to the work with the EPA that led to the you know, 2025 you know, standards, where you've now got regulators who have engineers on their team and who in many cases are engineers, and they, they want to solve problems too, and, and they're, they're you know, happy to work with other engineers to figure out what's the best way to do this, rather than you know, the, the way that it was in the first you know, round of, uh, of you know, regulations for safety and, and emissions 40 years ago, where you know, people would just you know, throw a dart and say, this is what you got to do. Yeah. So I mean, it's a much more cooperative, iterative process that you're talking about now, and, and that seems to work better for everybody. Well, I think there's just an clearer understanding that technology is going to be moving forward regardless of whether you like it in terms of the rules or not, and therefore you're either going to be with it or you're going to be eclipsed by it, and you might as well get ahead of the game rather than being a, a laggard. And, uh, but I think, I think you're right, though. We're going we're gonna to see this much sooner Rather It'll happen later. fast, you know, because Mark, uh, the technologies you mentioned, the automated braking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think it's Boston Consulting Group did a, a study of it all. They, they think that alone could save 10,000 lives sure. a year, 10,000. So, you know, I, I understand there's some people who say, look, we got to make sure that this stuff is right. But let's not wait until it's 100 percent. You know, if it's 99 percent, I, I say, let's just go with it, because I, I think, like I said, I, I did the math. It works out to about 108 fatalities every single day. And that's just in the U.S. You know, globally, it's way more than that. So this we lose car, by way. The car thing is really dangerous. I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, good. I think we've exhausted some perfectly good topics to talk about. So it's uh, probably a good time to, to wrap up the show. Have you guys driven the Mirai? I have. Did, Not yet. No, yet. looking forward to it. You, you know, you'll drive it and you'll go, okay. <laughs> No, and that's you see that's a good thing. It's I mean, it always it always occurred to me that that one of the one of the problems with with alternative hybrid or alternative powertrains is there's always the screen that shows you here's the electricity that's going here and it's going to the motor and it's going to the wheels and now it's going from the wheels to the you know, it's just like you know what when that goes away when it just becomes another powertrain. Who cares, right? You just say, okay, I want... That's when you declare victory. Right. You just say, yeah. I want this one that has this many miles per gallon and does this and, and has, has these features. That's but, part of what's interesting to me about the Mirai as well, because they didn't make it... It is, as you said, a science experiment in, in many ways, but they didn't make it look like a science experiment. So it, it, it's you know, a car that is maybe not for the really early adopters who want to be waving a flag saying, hey, look at me. It's, it's just a car. Mm -hmm. yeah. An unusual looking car, but a yeah. car. But I mean, but yeah, I mean, but I mean, that's the whole thing. So it's just, so I think what we just have to say is, is that, I mean, you know, most people, you could just weld their hoods shut and they would never know what was inside it. Is that a right. eight in it? It's yeah. got a four that, in it. That's like 90% yeah. of the car buying sure. public. Right. It's just, it, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. And it, it's like your phone. I mean, does it work? Does it not work? Mm -hmm. I, you know, do you have a quad core right. processor? I don't know or care. Yeah, right. You know? right. Yeah, I'm here. So cool. Okay, anyway. we'll wrap it up now. Yeah, <laughs> Mark Feelin, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Everybody can reach your your stuff at freep.com. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And see see him live sometimes on there on, or videos. Of, some, some videos of me of driving Mark. other cars and doing other stuff. Yeah, yes, it's, it's fascinating. Okay, and uh, we'll invite everybody to join. You and I, Gary, for another episode of AutoLine After Hours. Well, good. Okay, signing off. Thanks, everybody, for having tuned in. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, and by Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. Visit our website, AutoLine.tv, where you can watch us live 24-7.
Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with AutoLine Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine This Week. There's all that and much more at AutoLine.tv.